Hi, namaste. My name is Henry Jodicaire, and this is number five in my series of videos on the lies and deceit of Tulsi Gabbard and her guru, Chris Butler. If you would like to know who I am and why I am doing those expose on this cult, please look at video number one where I explain clearly who I am and why I am doing these videos. Today I would like to focus my attention on the testimonial of a ex-disciple of Chris Butler. One of the most sad part of this cult is how children who were born and raised in the cult called Science of Identity were treated and how they were forced to see Chris Butler as their Lord and Savior. And if they would not participate or accept Chris Butler as their Lord and Savior, they were shunned from their family, as you will see in this testimonial. So this is the testimonial of a young lady called Lalita that was born and raised in the cult of Chris Butler in Australia in the 1980s. So this is what she has to say. I remember how Chris Butler held this larger-than-life presence in my childhood. In everything I did, I had to think about how it would benefit Chris Butler. He was my parents' spiritual master, and they looked to him for guidance on everything, from what to eat to how to raise their children, and they did all that he asked them to do without any question. When I talk to people about the lack of questioning, they find that aspect odd. It is odd, but to put it into perspective, I was raised to believe Chris Butler was God's voice on earth. And if you questioned him or offended him in any way, you were effectively offending God. And because we believe in reincarnation, that meant you would be reborn as the lowest life form imaginable, possibly a worm in stool. And then you would have to spend eons working your way back into God's good grace to get a human form again. So questioning the leader was spiritual suicide, which was seen as worse than death. So there was no questioning. In his lectures, Chris Butler also would ridicule the intelligence of anyone he did not like belittling anyone he felt was questioning his authority even slightly. He demanded the utmost dedication and loyalty from his followers, and if he did not get it, the punishment were swift and severe. I remember an instance where people were told that they were not allowed to eat for weeks because they did not cook the food of Butler to his liking. Literally everything we did had to go through Chris Butler for authorization. If you wanted to work outside the group, you had to ask his permission. No one could get married without his consent. From the late 1980s, all of us kids were removed from public school because he did not want public school influencing our mind away from serving him. So from that point on, we were homeschooled 
until schools were established in the Philippines. After that, most children were sent to boarding schools in the Philippines for intense schooling. According to my information, these kids were traumatized in such environment, which was like a prison. Classes were on hygiene and cooking, and all the skills needed to one day serve Chris Butler for the rest of our life. My opinion now is that those schools in the Philippines were surely to avoid the scrutiny of the Australian and the U.S. government agencies. I can't even imagine how dreadful it was for my friends who were sent there. I was lucky to avoid going to the Philippines, but I did not avoid lack of schooling. And by the time I officially left the cult, Science of Identity, in 1997, just before I turned 20, I had only received up to a fifth grade education. From a young child, I remember one of the main features of my life was the lecture that were sent to us via tape to listen to. And many of the children had to listen to those tape with headphones before they went to sleep at night. Basically, these were one hour long sessions of Chris Butler talking about his belief how evil and out of control gay people were acting around the world, how women were inferior and subhuman and should be controlled by their husband, how messed up and evil the outside world was, and how his own relationship with God was so special. Only he could lead us back to God, to heaven. Chris Butler was always boasting that he had so much control over his own existence on earth that he could choose the moment of his own death. We worshipped him, even loved him. Another part of his teaching was that all life is an illusion. And because it is all an illusion, all relationship were an illusion. We were encouraged to not invest in any relationship other than a relationship with him, our guru. So we were, in effect, isolated from our parents who did their best not to love us, as per recommendation of Chris Butler. And instead, they look at him like a surrogate father, a messiah figure. He was this imposing force in our life that we weren't supposed to offend which is frankly terrifying when you're a small child. I remember having many nightmares and a condition called sleep paralysis, which was brought on by the great stress I was living at the time. My parents did their best to keep us in schools, but when Chris Butler heard that some parents were resisting his order to take all the kids out of public school, his directive was clear. Get them out of public schools or you will be rejected as my disciple. Every time my parents would try to take us to school, my sister would become hysterical and then she would start having seizure. That was the power that Chris Butler had over us. I really wanted to paint these pictures of my childhood because Tulsi Gabbard grew up in the same cult as I did. And Tulsi Gabbard 
also was in the schools in the Philippines for two years. There is another testimonial by Jan Kovac that says clearly that boys were shown pornographic homosexual movies in that school to discourage them from ever attempting homosexual act and these young kids were just 9, 10, 11, 12, up to 14 year old. It was a form of aversion therapy to try to stop them from ever trying the homosexual lifestyle. But it did not work. Many of those boys became homosexual anyway. All Americans should know that Tulsi Gabbar was subjected to the same environment I was. And she's still surrounded by this group and this cult and she calls Chris Butler her guru. This is why the increased interest in her rise in political power, now a presidential candidate, concern me greatly. I want to be very clear, I have no issue with Tulsi Gabbard as far as I'm concerned. She is as much a victim as I am, more so because she was groomed from an early age, specifically for the path she is now on. What I am concerned about is the control I know Chris Butler has over her the influence he has over her ability to make decisions, decisions that could become laws and impact a whole lot of people. I know what an abusive, misogynistic, homophobic, germophobic, narcissistic nightmare is Chris Butler. So I spoke out about Chris Butler before a few years ago and the result was that my family cut off all contact with me. This has happened to every other person I know who got out of the cult and tried to expose the cult for what it is. I now hope that one day Tulsi Gabbard will leave this cult but for now while she is a disciple of Chris Butler, his influence over her makes her dangerous and unreliable because Chris Butler is dangerous and unpredictable. So I think that this testimonial is very powerful and very clear that this guy, Chris Butler, is a very dangerous cult leader and his influence on the mind and the subconscious mind of Tulsi Gabbard makes Tulsi Gabbard herself very dangerous and unpredictable. What type of lectures were those children forced to listen when they were children, many of them with headphones before going to bed? Well, in several of my others' video, I have put a recording of Chris Butler demonizing gay people. I am going to finish this video putting again this recording for those of you that have not listened already is rant, which is offensive, disgusting, crazy, ignorant, dangerous. Thank you very much and please listen carefully to this megalomaniac, pseudo-spiritual master, 
Chris Butler. The most extreme example is the homosexuals. They feel so bad about what they're doing, they can't enjoy what they're doing because they feel so guilty about it, so angry and so, you know, that, they're, that they are bad. They know they're doing something wrong that's not pleasing to God. And so they have to try to convince themselves that they have to try so hard to convince themselves that what they're doing is okay that they march around signs saying, I'm gay and I'm proud. Gee, why do you need to walk around with a sign doing that? I'm good. Sitting and meditating every day. I'm good, I'm good, I'm not bad, I'm good. I'm good. I'm happy. You're so unhappy you have to give yourself the name gay. In order to try to lift up your spirits. You know, it's such a bummer. You can only lift your spirits up by giving yourself a name. Take the name happy. I'll call myself happy, that'll work. Here's this guy in total misery. My, what's your name? Happy. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you get that name? Well, I figured if I took that name, people keep saying it over and over, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay. I, 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 you know, I would get that way. <laughs> it's just a sign of how miserable they are and they don't want to... And, and, and what is the cause? You see, even if they got rid of all those people that they call homophobes and all these mean priests and, and bishops and Christians and, and all these people, if they got rid of all these people who are making them miserable they still would not be happy because the Supreme Lord is still in their heart. And He's saying, you're wrong. You're going down the wrong path. And what are they going to do? Try to dig Him out? What are they going to do? Carry protest signs? Get out of my heart! <laughs> I can get the homophobes out of public office and out of their jobs and off the radio stations and off of TV, but I can't get the supreme homophobe, the supreme anti-faggot guy, the supreme fag fighter, I can't get that sucker out of my heart. We're going to walk around and have, you know, it does, it's not going to matter. You can get rid of everybody outside, but you're still going to be hearing that voice inside going, don't be a faggot. You're wrong. What you're doing is wrong. We can't, we can't do that, you see? So we become very angry. I've never met angrier, more unhappy people than so-called gays. They're so filled with anger, it just seeps out of their pores. Their hatred is palpable. Their anger and hatred. Anything that reminds them of God, ultimately, is the source of that. Unless they can twist it in some way. But tell me, I mean, I know this is probably weird, but isn't it true that if the faggot stopped screwing the other faggot's asses, wouldn't AIDS stop? <laughs>